Hello everybody, my name is Bricky, and currently my merchandise site Orchidate.com is having a massive blowout sale, a final grab sale. I made this site a long time ago, and I bought myself all kinds of various types of merch, and I overbought. Simply put, I bought too much. And as we are transitioning into a new era of said merchandise site, it is time for me to sell all of the remaining stock I can at a significantly discounted price. These are really old school shirts like the Minimalist Tee, there is the Incredibilis hoodie, which has always been a pretty fun one, the 36th Anniversary Tee, which I always thought was a, a bit of an underrated design, I was quite proud of that one. You have the Cyberpunk Ruby 8-Ball, which is the one I am currently wearing right now, always Love the back of this one too. And a ton more. They are all gonna be listed in a last chance sale tab on the site right now. And the prices are bottom, a bottom, like you. Hoodies, $20, all sizes, all colors, everything. Long sleeves, 15. T-shirts, $10 only. All of it is cheap as chips. And you have only this month to grab it before it all is gone. So check it out, orchidate.com in the description, last chance sale, give it a look, and let's talk about Lightfall. Hello everybody, my name is Bricky, currently saying, well, it's no Titanfall 2, every time I use the strand grapple. One day I said to my stream, which of these three things are true? It, is gaming just feeling a bit poor lately? Like, not bad, but between Callisto Protocol, Forspoken, Hogwarts, Atomic Heart, everything is just, it just looked a bit mid, and I haven't really wanted to get into it. Two, is Destiny actually getting pretty good? Have we reached a point where the meme of the game being bad is no longer, it's not even worth spouting anymore? Or three, am I just down bad? Does Destiny just have its hooks in me and scraping across my chest to an extent that I just can't pull myself away? Am I stuck in the gorilla grip of Callus and the Kabussi? We came to the conclusion that it was a bit of all three. A conclusion that came just in time for the launch of the newest major expansion in the Destiny franchise, Lightfall. There was a weight on the shoulders of Lightfall though. The Witch Queen was the best campaign Destiny has ever had, and no, I will not hear otherwise. It is the strongest in almost every single category and nothing else comes even close. Not Taken King, not Forsaken, nothing. And those are some pretty big shoes to fill. Shoes that The Witness, the newest big bad of destiny, are attempting to steal. So our campaign starts off where the end of the season's left off from with Witch Queen. The Witness is this mega mind looking thing who is attempting to, to our understanding, destroy the Traveler. Now, our Traveler, having left our orbit and is now confronted by the pyramid ships attempting to hold it at bay. And this opening cutscene is pretty good. The Traveler finally does something, shoots a, a giant beam of life, so to speak, at various ships, but, but big witness with a flick of his wrist just murders all of our defenses and discovers an important artifact called the Veil on Neptune. Our guardian is now tasked with dealing with it. Boarding one of the ships, we make our way to Neptune, and in Destiny fashion, the game still looks incredible. If there's one thing Bungie will always get right, it's just the skyboxes. They have some way of making things look so, so big and real. Just mission one, jumping across space on asteroids, it's, it's so pretty. And look, and look, it's our boy! Oh, is that you, my tenacious? My shadow region. <laughs> Revel in these hollow victories. I want you in the best of spirits when we meet in the arena. In place of Savathun, our main physical bad guy, you know, the one we actually get to fight, is Callus, ex emperor of the Cabal. Callus, you might remember if you were a D2 veteran as the main raid boss on the Leviathan. Kinda. But he's been here and there many times throughout the story, and he's just, he's an absolute top G, alright? I am a certified Callus simp, okay? Callus, my beloved. He has given himself over to the Witness as the new disciple. Rook being the first disciple, the raid boss of the Witch Queen. Now we have our boy, and oh my god, just look at his drip. His hair, whack! His gear, whack! His jewelry, whack! His foot stands, whack! 
God damn. Does he look ugly, but in like that beautiful way? He's that kind of ugly that people with with no taste but lots of money have. Like like Andrew Tate ugly. Just a complete lack of style, but the ability to buy everything. It fits him perfectly, and, and even he agrees. My semblance matches my inner beauty. So the story plays out like this. The witness is looking for a very important artifact called the veil. While they have a stare down with the traveler for I, I guess possibly days in real time. Callus, the disciple, is sent to gather the veil for whatever nefarious purpose the witness has for it. This veil is on Neptune and in a city never before seen by us, the guardians on Earth called Neo Muna. Guarding the city are cloud striders, enormous himbo stereotypes that love chrome as much as they love getting shot in the ribs. Now this is the major objective of the campaign. Find this thing called the veil before the witness and Callus can take it, to probably kill the Traveler. Protect the citizens of Niamuna, which are all basically uploaded into the metaverse and turned into human NFTs, and, you know, not die in the process. But we'll be there soon. Stay frosty, Tyrion. Stay... Stay frosty, Terrans. Now, venturing out into this new place is where we start to get into the good of this DLC. Niamuna is absolutely gorgeous as a play space. It is dripping in atmosphere, has a great vibrant color palette, and for the most part, feels decently dense when it comes to enemy activity. Nothing quite tops the visual ecstasy of the throne world, but that destination is a bit lacking on enemy density. Neomuna is just amazing to run around in from a combat point of view. I'm very pleased that most of the campaign missions take place there. Now I played the campaign on Legendary and Solo, and for me, the Witch Queen was so much harder than Lightfall, and I have zero consistency with that opinion. Some say it's easier, some say it's harder, some say the porridge is mm, just right. But for me, I had Quicksilver Storm, a target locked fourth times enhanced retrofit escapade, and Actium War Rig. Everything died. <laughs> Retrofit Escapade, my beloved. And when I wasn't using that, we had the new Laura Lace ornament because apparently during the strand sections, I still got the restoration despite having strand quite often because we had faster recharge times too. Big Pog. Anyway, back on track. Our missions mainly consisted of fighting the new Shadow Legion Cabal, which is basically normal Cabal with strand shields and funky backpacks that give AoE shields to their comrades, much like the Moths and the Witch Queen, just AoE instead. For the most part, the enemy variety was the same with the addition of one, one, one brand new enemy, the Tormentor. The Tormentor is absolutely ballin'. They're cabalin'. Hello everybody, they are a darkness type reaper that has this huge move set as a ton of damage, goes fast, and genuinely is a great threat in a fight. Throwing purple projectiles, making a, a portal of purple stuff, spitting out damage, a grab move, suppression, and that insane dive bomb attack. Man, tormentors are so fun. When I think of a good enemy design, I will always go back to Mass Effect 3, and these boys remind me of the Banshees so much. Supplemental range damage are way faster than they look, are way tankier than they look, and you want to be as far away from them at all times. It's an adrenaline rush, having to run away from one of these things yelling, don't touch me, 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 keep away from my, my, my little butthole. That Tormentor's coming for your butthole. He's gonna do it. And you know what? That's awesome. And they're used pretty sparingly too, because the issue with these kinds of enemies mainly come around to when they're spammed. There aren't really enough enemies that force us on the back foot. Most enemies are kind of slow advancing types or the fire from range type. There really aren't a whole lot of break you from cover type enemies that are utilized, at least not in a meaningful way. Normally, the ones that do are like fodder enemies, dogs, vandals, gladiators, thralls, things like that. This enemy demands respect and a just the way you play the game, and I really like that. It makes me hope that it'll be around for more encounters, but like with the Loosen Hive, I probably won't actually expect that to happen. So, 
Throughout the campaign, our guardian is being given strands. This this brand new subclass utilizing the fabric of souls, basically. The river of souls being tapped into. It's a confusing and unknowable energy, but it's something that the Cloud Striders have like a mythology for. It's also a type of energy that Kallus and his forces are not prepared for. So whenever they have ways of shutting off your light, whether it's through jammers or other variants, you can utilize strand to stop them. Which is very strange because the enemies of the Shadow Legion have strand shields, which I know is like a gameplay thing, but you know, still. And um, okay, I delayed talking about the campaign for long enough now because there's nothing to talk about. Like the campaign's existence, experience, is basically a bunch of preventative busy work thrown together with a final end boss and some cutscenes in between. Because when I make videos on like certain campaigns, uh, the, the Modern Warfare 2 one, right? I, I go talking through the whole campaign, like we talk about the whole story, that whole thing. There's really not much to talk about. Most of the campaign involves Strand and the Cloud Striders of Neo Muna, discovering what Strand is, how to utilize Strand, and teaching you more and more about the subclass. The Cloud Strider stuff is keeping the people safe from Cabal attacks, Vex incursions, and more things mostly unrelated to the actual Veil artifact and the Witness's plans for the Traveler. Because the entire campaign is the wit- okay, the Witness and Kallus want the veil, right? They need the veil. We need to protect the veil to stop them from getting the veil, to use the veil to do a thing that we don't know what it is, but it's the witness, so it must be bad. Also, my name is Osiris, and I am the whiniest little baby bitch person you ever heard for an entirety of this campaign. Ooh, ooh. This campaign is going to be compared a lot to the Witch Queen, like excessively to the Witch Queen. And anyone who thinks that comparison is unfair is a fool, a foolish fool with their foolishly fooled short pants making them a fool. I have heard talks that this campaign shouldn't be compared as it is a filler story before the final shape, which is just a buck wild claim considering it costs the exact same amount as the Witch Queen and is therefore under the exact same scrutiny from a price to quality product comparison. I didn't do a great job saying those words out loud right there, but I got my point across and that's all that matters. So if we roll back a little bit. Witch Queen wise, each mission had a point because the game was investigative. The theme Savathun and her brood presented was that of a detective mystery. All of the pieces are there, right? You have Ikora as the boss sending you out on the case. And then you have the investigative board. And you even have all the weapon names like Empirical Evidence, Likely Suspect, Forensic Nightmare. And you even have Finch, who plays the, the young go-getter who is way over their head but wants to help. It even has the archetype that he's injured from the original scuffle with the bad guy. Just instead of a, an arm in a sling, he's missing a mandible on his shell. So each mission at least felt purposeful. Sure, there were some that were a little fillery, but you were on a trail of leads to unravel how in the ever-loving fuck Savathun got the light of the Traveler, which culminated in a genuinely fantastic reveal that she didn't steal shit. The Traveler gave it to her willingly. There was a real quest, a real curiosity, a case, something to actually discover, a twist, a real answer to your questions. All capped off with an extremely challenging endgame boss fight and a cutscene showing the architect of everything terrible, the witness. Not only did the story end on a note of excitement for the future, but it was self-contained. The Savathun story was complete. The story beats were satisfying, and with the witness reveal, it helped tell us a ton about the lore of destiny. No, light and dark aren't good and evil. They are powers. The witness was the cause of the original collapse. They wield darkness as a weapon. The witness is an evil person. Savathun wielded the light, and though this might be somewhat debatable, was the major evil villain just using light instead of dark. The story concluded well. The questions we had were answered, and the new questions posed were intriguing and not frustrating. Lightfall contains none of these aspects. The story is about stopping the Witness and Callus from utilizing the Veil. What is the Veil? I don't fucking know. They never tell you. They yell at you over and over again about the importance of the veil. Gotta get the veil. Gotta make sure they don't get the veil. Don't let them get the veil. They don't tell you what the veil is. This doesn't feel right. The veil? Metal. Gear. Nobody knows what the veil is. And they keep yelling at you. Oh, we can't let them get that veil. Rohan, one of the Cloud Striders, voiced by Dave Finoy. 
I think, uh, also known as Lee in Telltale The Walking Dead, is killed off halfway through the story before he even gets any genuine time to shine. Halfway through, three hours basically, on the hard difficulty, he sacrifices himself to stop the radial mast. What's the radial mast? Not a sex position apparently, but it's an artifact from Callus that is also not explained. So this whole time we have excellent VA Dave Fenoy playing this new Cloud Strider character, telling us to get the van that we don't know what it does, and then stops and kills himself to stop the radial mast that we don't know what it does. You kill that level of talent that fast. So then you're stuck with Nimbus and Osiris, and by God, they are not it. They are just flat out not it. Everything that's come at us, you're just like, Also, you named them Nimbus. You know what you've done. I called them Nimbusi the entire goddamn game. I couldn't help it. That one's on you. In Witch Queen, you had Ikora and Finch making up the dialogue for your campaign. While I know not everyone loved Finch, I did. He brought a great deal of serious humor, so to speak. The humor wasn't him cracking jokes. It was just the situation he was in and how out of his element he was. Also, I think his VA is actually really stellar and he sells the role quite well. Ikora is a, a little bit bland as a character, but she still is a pretty good voice and I will always have a soft spot for her from Firefly. This time around, the two main characters are Nimbus and Osiris and I think they both fall short for two different reasons. Now, Nimbus is, I think, the first non-binary character in Destiny. And that right there, fucking awesome. While LGBT and trans characters are becoming a bit more prevalent as well in games media, I can only think of one other non-binary character right now, which is Bloodhound and Apex Legends. So for that, I am super stoked, which is why it kills me to say that I absolutely despise Nimbus. They are a picture-perfect example of everything wrong with Marvel movie humor. They attempt to make quips and jokes all the time, and it always comes off as extremely forced or downright unacceptable. Like when they joked on how ugly Callus was after his boss fight. So, you know, Callus right now, spoilers, is dead. And they say this right in front of their fucking daughter. Well, the uglier they are, the harder they fall, right? No? Come on. How is that signed off on? How are you gonna do that to my boy? You're gonna call peak male performance ugly from the Cloud Strider with the ribcage window? Often there are two reasons a character fails from a voice acting perspective. One is that the voice actor isn't doing a very good job, or two, their script is just terrible. For Nimbus, it's their script being terrible. There are times where they actually sound pretty solid, even though I'm not a huge fan of the strange audio alterations to their voice. But overall, there are moments where Nimbus is giving a pretty good performance, but they do so many things, so many jokes and quips that give me secondhand embarrassment to even look at it. And I hate it. Well, if you drop us, it might be my funeral, but whatever, it'll be fun. Osiris, on the other hand, I just don't think is very good. I don't like saying this. I don't like pointing to someone specifically and saying, you did a bad job, but I just don't think Osiris's voice work was very good at all. And I don't think it was his script. He had terrible line delivery consistently. Now, this is a theory. A game theory. But Bungie mentioned that they have gone almost entirely remote, which in its own right isn't bad at all. Honestly, preferable in a lot of ways. But I don't 100% know if this extended to the voice actors too, because having multiple voice actors in the same room to read lines after each other gives conversations a sense of flow, lets you understand tone. Right now, every single one of Osiris's lines sounds like it was read after reading a script that says, Ghost says X line in an upset tone. Your line is blank. There's no flow. Like it all sounds segmented from each other. It feels like it lacks cohesion. The perspective shift was all we were missing. Do not underestimate this moment. This is the product of humbling training, many failures, and your determination. I'll do whatever it takes to stop the witness. So if you aren't going to help me, then leave me alone. We regroup at the watchtower. You don't understand. We've got to get to the Vale. We'll help push back Callus's advances. 
We've done nothing but waste time. Another example to this point would be when Saint-14 and Shax have that dialogue in the previous season way back when. That's probably the best example of that lack of cohesion I can think about. Warlord Shax, as I live and breathe. Saint-14? I thought you were dead. Brother, I have always hated you. <laughs> it doesn't sound like these people, particularly Shax in that one, sounds like he's talking to someone else. It sounds like he's talking as if he's guessing exactly how Saint was talking. It feels so segmented, it falls just so flat. Not to mention just how whiny he was the entire story. I get it, Sagira's dead, it's very sad, but Oh my god. There's probably a word to describe this, like, disassociation with voice acting that I don't know about because I'm just not that smart, but I hope I can at least have you understand what I'm trying to get at. Also, moving back to the game, it just feels like there's no stakes. Zero risk in Destiny. Why won't any characters actually die? Actual characters. Not Mr. Lee from The Walking Dead after two and a half to three hours of gameplay. Why aren't you killing anyone actual off. Who was ever in danger, really, this entire campaign? It was the Neomuna people and two Cloud Striders we barely knew. Like, there's no tension, there's no worry, there's nothing. You know what the best part of this campaign was? My boy Callus, baby! Callus has that setup. He was the first raid boss. He was around in multiple seasons, came to a head in Season of the Haunted, got a whole dungeon about him in duality, and bam! He's there with his inner beauty as a disciple of the Witness, and he kills it man his voice acting is amazing miles above every single other one of the cast he is just a joy to have around every single time he's on screen that fear is your failure my failure my failure i defend this force with vicious subjugation batter down the gates of our enemies and see Dark glittering pride. Why? Because I wanted it. You hold the universe in your grasp, and all you can think of to do with it is secure the veil. We will create the link. Infinite apologies. The veil is yours. He's so good! So you can imagine my disappointment when we get one of the best gameplay segments in the Destiny campaign, where you and Keitel slaughter Kallus' reinforcements and hold off wave after wave of Shadow Legion. Tanks, troops, and tormentors abound. This long holdout wave defense type mission that really makes me feel like we should have a wave defense mode in this game, just, just gotta say. This monumental battle. The most enemies I have ever seen on screen at one time. Tons of strand usage, orbital lasers, everything. Get the giant Kallus face in the sky, Kaido with their big hammer ready to duke it out. And I'm 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 on cloud nine, right? I got this high, this high of excitement. And then it's time for that big final boss, and you make your way down to the bottom area by the veil, and you fight Kallus, and he's just a big colossus. No new moves like Sabathun, no different abilities, no special mechanics. He just reuses that caretaker thing. He's a colossus. This was supposed to be our shining moment. Kallus testing our guardian for genuine years through challenges, through, through petty squabbles. All of this training and bravado between us and the end result is a surprisingly easy Colossus fight and then a second phase where he's just a normal ass gladiator. I was playing on legendary solo and I did this First try, no deaths. I even killed him using Rulk's Glaive, just for the meme. The first disciple's signature weapon, killing the most recent disciple. A big Colossus and then a big Gladiator killed first try. And now Callus is dead. Genuinely gone. My boy, my beloved. I lost one of my favorite characters in such an unsatisfying way. Speaking of unsatisfying, our ghost gets grabbed by the witness and creates the link, which I still don't know what that means with the veil that I don't know what that is. They get blasted by a ray of rainbow light, make a gigantic triangle in the traveler, and then them and their ships fuck off inside of it. And then it ends. And that's it. What is the veil? You aren't told. Where did the witness go? We don't know. What did they do? I have no idea. The traveler is gone. 
No, it isn't. It's literally right there. The Traveler. Gone. Should I feel humbled by this sacrifice? How do you know that? It's sacrifice? It's still there. How do you know things that I don't know? The ghost says, I can't feel its presence anymore. We still have our powers, motherfucker. We still have the light. We didn't lose anything. The Traveler hasn't done anything for a decade. Why do you think it's gone? It's right there. Do you mean like, oh, it's gone, like no longer at the tower, like no longer down on the surface of Earth? That happened at the end of last season. Not now. Why do you act like you know something I don't know? What the fuck happened? Is this like season four of Lost, for God's sake? The direct comparison I hear all the time is that this feels like the Infinity War of Destiny and Final Shape is the end game. It's even equipped with the gigantic brute monster villain clad in gold. But Infinity War, one, had stakes, two, explained what was happening, and three, didn't leave me the feeling of absolute confusion. Thanos wants the Infinity Stones, but I know what those are. I know what they do. The witness's end goal is what? What the hell did they do? The veil, what is it? We know Thanos' end goal, kill half of the universe's population. We know what's at stake. And at the end, when he does do it, the question isn't what did he do? The question is how do we recover from this? A genuinely good, intriguing question that you get excited for in the next one. I'm left frustrated, confused, and unfulfilled. The reason I'm excited for the final shape is not because I'm excited for another Witch Queen level expansion. I'm excited to find out what in God's name happened in Lightfall, which is so disappointing that this is the taste in my mouth I'm left with. This is what I fixate on the most because it's the thing that feels so aggravating, the thing that stings the most. It's a sting that pulls my mind away from all the good things that Lightfall did. Because for the most part, story aside, Lightfall has some pretty great gameplay. I sung the praises of the Tormentors already, but Strand, oh, Strand is the best. Strand is just such a unique and enjoyable new concept in this game and I can't stop enjoying myself with it. The builds you can create with it, the concepts and strategies, they feel so numerous. Flying around with the grapple is amazing, the threadling builds and little, little seeker bug things are a ton of fun. Suspensions and the buffs and oh, oh, I adore Strand, adore Strand. It'll probably ruin PvP like Stasis, but hopefully not as bad as Stasis, but you know how it is when a new class comes out. Neo Muna is really pretty. It's a bit of an annoyance to traverse, like you really need that secondary spawn point because otherwise it's a pain to travel, but it's still really nice. It looks gorgeous, has a lot of great environments, the lost sectors are really good, has some of the better patrol locations, not as good as a throne world, but still good. The weapons are fun to use, I like a lot of the new perk rolls, and the strange high weapons are pretty enjoyable. Quicksilver Storm is one of my favorite exotics, now like a top five, I love that gun. Crafting system was toned down a lot, it's requirements, which is really good, and, and funny enough, Season of Defiance has some amazing activities, not to mention how hmm, cabalin that artwork is in the background. Bungo, I, I know I just yelled at you for the last like 30 minutes, but please, for love of God, please release that artwork of Marasov knighting us. Please release that artwork like as a print or something. I buy that immediately. I would buy that in a heartbeat. And the quality of life updates might be the best part of the entire expansion. Oh, they're probably Strand. Close second. The new changes are so immensely game changing for someone like me who was somewhat understanding of build, but not quite there. The ability to create loadouts is such a welcome change. And the fact that it also determines your armor's ornaments adds an even greater amount of freedom to it. Swapping builds on the fly is so easy and I get to keep my drip too. It's a genuine game changer. The guardian commendations I love and activity screen great too. I like commendations in games as pretty well, I think they're actually a really nice addition. And the whole guardian rank part too, showing up a person's dedication to all the aspects of the game as opposed to how hard they've grinded this season is great. The journey tab is just clean. It's simple, but effective. Build crafting too is something that I know is a, is a bit divisive, but I personally like it. It definitely lowered the power of a lot of people's builds and it made it a, a bit too simplified overall, but hot take? 
I'm actually for that at the moment. Revamping the system itself in a way to change the foundational elements so new build ideas can be made in the future that aren't out of reach of more casual players sounds like a great idea to me. I'd take simplified and accessible over complicated and stronger, so long as it can be built upon more in the future. A step back is fine if it means there are more steps forward that can be taken. See, a lot of this expansion feels like that Game of Thrones badly drawn horse meme. In fact, that's exactly what I posted after finishing the campaign. It does leave a final question, like a final debate for Destiny, a debate that it has had for quite a while, and that's the debate of price. Life Falls an expansion at $50, or the entire year for $100. Which queen was the same price, if I recall correctly? And in that video, I remember defending the game's price quite a bit. For the content you got, for the length of the campaign, the new additions, so on and so forth, it felt worth it. If you are one of those kinds of people who do the whole one hour per dollar of game time thing, I mean, you're completely fine. This whole next year will give you far more than 100 hours of gameplay. Lightfall originally made me feel similar until I started to really look into what I have here. Like the new location is nice, but it's, I only got one strike. It revamped some old ones, but that's just, bringing old ones back into line. There are some of the other things like exotic missions and new exotic quests, but those only fill in a certain few hours of time, some not even that long. But what really hurts was just no attention to everything else. Like the Vanguard playlist is for new people. And to be fair, they don't really need to change it much, but I would have liked a little more of something. Throwing in prior seasonal activities like the season of the Risen just doesn't feel like enough. Crucible is supposed to get three new maps, but that's one per season. So there's only one single new map right now. Not to mention the amount that keep getting removed from rotation. Like there are a lot of maps that feel like they should be back in now. Gambit got nothing. No changes, no new maps, not even bringing back old maps. Where's that Dreaming City one? I love the Dreaming City map. I know this might also seem like a weird contention point and most people might not care about this, but can you do something to Dares of Eternity? Can you get a couple updates too? We don't have a Fallen final boss or a Scorn final boss. Also, why are new enemies never added anywhere? In fact, why are there always so few new enemies in general? Witch Queen added four, but it was more like three. Moths were one of them, and then one of the each hive classes for the light. But they're only in Witch Queen content. And in this time, it's even less. I mean, Tormentors are amazing. Love Tormentors. But a shielded cabal with a backpack and that's it? Like games priced at $60 are entirely new games. New games have entirely new enemies too. Adding the Taken as a faction, the Taken King, then the Scorn and Forsaken is pretty great. New factions with intrigue, but one new enemy in a backpack? Hell, Mass Effect 3's multiplayer that I keep talking about added the collectors, and not even just the collectors from Mass Effect 2, a revamped, revisioned version of the collectors for the third game for free. And they also added the Cerberus Dragoon character for Cerberus and the Geth Bomber, the big deluxe edition of Lightfall, the $100 one for the entire year I would say is for the most part somewhat defensible because the seasons are pretty solid. They have a ton of content, ton of new guns. They further the story. There are new dungeons, a legacy raid, et cetera, et cetera. For the most part, I, I don't hate the deluxe edition thing too much because a whole years of content and MMO is a pretty solid amount of money. If you were to take it monthly, it would be under $10 a month. And I'm pretty okay with that. But $50 for a Lightfall, what we got here, what we got from the package of Lightfall itself, there's just not enough to justify all that. It feels anemic compared to the Witch Queen. What we get just doesn't have enough substantial meat to it. It's also why the story sticks out as so painful because Destiny has good everything already. It has great gameplay. It has great visuals. It has great music. Everything that was already good in Destiny just got more of it, more good music, strand, more fun areas to go to, more visually appealing stuff. We already were nine out of 10 with this, but the thing you're lacking is your characters and story and overall narrative. And that was the thing you did really well with in Witch Queen, which is why it was such an insane expansion. Because the one thing you were really struggling with, you nailed. And you went right back to struggling with it again. The thing is though, the talk of price 
really doesn't matter to you, the viewer. Because when it comes to Destiny, you're in or you're not in. If you're in, like me, if it's your thing, if it's the game that you play all the time, if it's me, someone who plays it on my own time for fun, for relaxation, I am going to buy even the shit expansions. I wouldn't call Lightfall shit, but you know, other ones were, because I'm in, because this is the thing, I am in, I am part of this now. If you're out, you just don't really care. And if you were on the fence, you've probably already made up your mind. The new raid is going to be out by the time this video is out. And the new raid is arguably one of the biggest parts of the entire experience, but it is still roughly a one hour to maybe three hour experience once a week. That's only if you run it on every single character. If not, it's like a one hour experience once a week. Hello. Future Bricky here. I did the Root of Nightwares day one and unfortunately had a lot of internet issues and couldn't stream the whole thing, but on the first day we were able to finish up Encounter 1 and 2 and later on, unfortunately off camera, we finished off 3 and 4, making it my first ever uh, day one completion. I really, really like the raid. It's fantastic. I think it's a lot of fun, has a good visual appearance to it. Uh, it's a bit too easy, would like some health bars to be bumped up a little bit, particularly Nezarek. But overall, I think it's a fantastic raid for definitely new players. Kind of has a similar role to Deepstone Crypt. And I think that's a very good thing. And big thumbs up from future Bricky. Okay, back to past break. Despite all of my anger and annoyances, Destiny has its grip on my balls, and it's one of the few games I play for myself, on my own time, to relax. So I'm in. Whether you are depends on your friends, your free time, and your enjoyment in grinding. Because at the end of the day, I love Destiny, but I don't love Lightfall. And honestly, I expected more. Thank you for watching, everyone. I appreciate it. Sorry it's a bit of a bummer uh, type thing, but... That's how it is. I try to be fair and honest with my opinions. And my opinions can be really hot takes sometimes, but uh, they're still my takes. That's what it is. Check out the merch store. Check out the giant deal, huge thing. You got the whole month, best of luck. Um, I'll probably be streaming this game anyway. God damn it. Bye-bye. Come on. Obviously you're a skater.